is a. Who calls? Peace, ho! Caesar speaks. Who is it in the press that calls on me? Where the eyes of March. <laughs> what woman is that? A soothsayer bids you beware the eyes of March. Set her before me. Let me see her face. Woman, come from the throng. Look upon Caesar. <laughs> what sayest thou to me now? Speak to me again. Beware the eyes of March. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she is a dreamer. Let us leave her. Pass! Take way! Clear the path! Take way we come! Let's go. <laughs> Will you go see the order of the course? Not I. Oh, I pray you do. Uh, I am not gamesome. I do lack some part of that quick spirit that is in Antony. Let me not hinder, Cassius, your desires. I'll leave you. Brutus, I do observe you now of late. I have not from your eyes that gentleness and show of love as I was wont to have. You bear too stubborn and too strange a hand over your friend that loves you. Cassius, be not deceived. If I have veiled my look, I turn the trouble of my countenance merely upon myself. Vexed I am of late with passions of some difference, conceptions only proper to myself, which give some soil, perhaps, to my behaviors. But let not, therefore, my good friends be grieved, among which number, Cassius, be you one. Then, Brutus, I have much mistook your passion, by means whereof this breast of mine hath buried thoughts of great value, worthy cogitations. <laughs> Tell me, good Brutus, can you see your face? No, Cassius, for the eye sees not itself, but by reflection, <laughs> by some other things. It's just. And it is very much lamented, Brutus, that you have no such mirrors as will turn your hidden worthiness into your eye, that you might see your shadow. Now, I have heard where many of the best respect in Rome, except immortal Caesar, speaking of Brutus and groaning underneath this age's yoke, have wished that noble Brutus had his eyes. Into what dangers would you lead me, Cassius? that you would have me seek unto myself for that which is not in me. Therefore, good Brutus, be prepared to hear. And since you know you cannot see yourself so well as by reflection, I, your glass, will modestly discover to yourself that of yourself which you yet know not of. It means it's shouting. I do fear the people of... Rome have chosen Caesar for their queen. Aye, do you fear it? Then must I think you would not have it so? I would not, Cassius, yet I love her well. But wherefore do you hold me here so long? What is it you would impart to me? If it be aught toward the general good, set honor in one eye and death in the other, and I will look on both indifferently. For let the gods so speed me, as I love the name of honor more than I fear death. I know that virtue to be in you, Brutus, as well as I do know your outward favor. Well, honor is the subject of my story. I was born free as Caesar, so were you. We both have fed as well, and we can both endure the winter's cold as well as she. She had a fever when she was in Spain, and when the fit was on her, I did mark how she did shake. Tis true, this God did shake. Her coward lips did from their color fly, and that same eye whose bend doth all the world, 
did lose her luster. I did hear her groan. Aye, and that tongue of hers that bade the Romans mark her and write her speeches in their books. Alas, it cried, give me some drink, Titinius. As a sick girl, ye gods, it doth amaze me. A woman of such a feeble temper should so get the start of the majestic world and bear the palm alone. Another general shout. I do believe these applauses are for some new honors heaped on Caesar. Why, man, she doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we, petty men, walk under her huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Brutus and Caesar, what should be in that Caesar? Why should that name be sounded more than yours? Write them together, yours is as fair a name. Sound them, it doth become the mouth as well. Weigh them, it is as heavy. Conjure with them, <laughs> Brutus will start a spirit as soon as Caesar. Now in the names of all the gods at once, upon what meat? doth this our Caesar feed, that she is grown so great. Oh, you and I have heard our fathers say, there was a Brutus once that would have brooked the eternal devil to keep his state in Rome as easily as a king. What you would work me to, I have some aim. I have thought of this and of these times I should recount hereafter. For this present, I would not. So with love, I must entreat you, be any further moved. What you have said, I will consider. What you have to say, I will with patience hear and find a time both meet to hear and answer such high things. So then, my noble friend, chew upon this. Brutus had rather be a villager than to repute himself a son of Rome. Under these hard conditions at this time, is like to lay upon us. I am glad that my weak words have struck but thus much show of fire from Brutus. The games are done. Caesar is returning. The angry spot doth glow on Caesar's brow. Pluck Casca by the sleeve. He'll tell us what the matter is. Aye, let us hence. Yon Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. They're not, Caesar. He's not dangerous. He's a noble Roman and well given. I fear him not. Yet if my name were liable to fear, I do not know the man I should avoid so soon as that. Spare Cassius. He's a great observer and looks quite through the deeds of men. He loves no plays, as thou dost, Antony. He hears no music. Seldom he smiles, and smiles in such a sort as if he mocked himself and scorned his spirit that could be moved to smile at anything. Such men as he be never at heart's ease while they behold a greater than themselves, and therefore are they dangerous. I rather... Tell thee what is to be feared than what I fear. For always I am Caesar. Come on my right hand and tell me truly what thou thinkst of him. You pulled me by the sleeve. Will you speak with me? Aye, Casca. Tell us what hath chanced today that Caesar looks so sad. Why? You were with her, were you not? I should not then ask Casca what had chanced. Why, there was a crown offered her. And being offered her, she put it by with the back of her hand, thus. And the people fell a-shouting. What was the second noise for? Why, for that too. 
They shouted thrice. What was the last cry for? Why, for that too. Was the crown offered her thrice? Aye, Mary wast. And she put it by thrice, every time gentler than other. And at every putting by, mine honest neighbors shouted. Who offered her the crown? By Antony. Tell me the manner of it, gentle Casca. <laughs> I can as well be hanged as tell the manner of it. It was mere foolery. I did not mark it. I saw Mark Antony offer her a crown. <laughs> Yet, yeah, t'was not a crown, neither. T'was one of those uh, coronets. And as I told you, she put it by once, but for all that, to my thinking, she would fain have had it. Then he offered it to her again, and she put it by again, but to my thinking, she was very loath to lay her fingers off it. And then he offered it the third time. She put it the third time by, and still as she refused it, the rabblemen tooted and clapped their chapped hands and threw their sweaty nightcaps and uttered such a deal of stinking breath that it had almost choked Caesar, for she swooned and fell down at it. And for my own part, I durst not laugh for fear of opening my lips and receiving the bad air. But soft, I pray you, what? Did Caesar swoon? She fell down in the marketplace and foamed at the mouth and was speechless. Tis very like. She hath the falling sickness. No, no, Caesar hath it not. But you and I, and honest Casca, we have the falling sickness. I know not what you mean by that. But I am sure Caesar fell down. If the tag rag people did not clap her and hiss her according as she pleased and displeased them, as they used to do, the players in the theater, I am no true man. What said she when she came unto herself? <laughs> Mary, before she fell down, when she perceived that the common herd was glad she refused the crown, she plucked me up her doublet and offered them her throat to cut. And had I been a man of any occupation, if I would not have taken her at a word, I would, I might go to hell among the rogues. And so she fell. When she came to herself again, she said, if she had done or said anything amiss, she desired their worships to think it was her infirmity. Therefore, wenches where I stood, cried, alas, good soul, and forgave her. <sighs> But there's no heed to be taken of them. If Caesar had stabbed their mothers, they would have done no less. And after that, she came thus sad away. Aye. Did Cicero say anything? Aye, he spoke Greek. To what effect? Nay, and I'll tell you that I'll never look you in the face again. But those that understood him smiled at one another and shook their heads. But for my own part, it was Greek to me. There was more foolery yet, if I could remember it. Will you sup with me tonight, Casca? No, I'm promised forth. Will you dine with me tomorrow? Aye, if I be alive and your mind hold, and your dinner worth the eating. Good, I will expect you. Do so. Farewell. Both. <laughs> what a blunt fellow is this grown to be? He was quick metal when he went to school. Tomorrow, if you please to speak with me, I will come home to you, or if you will, come home to me, and I will wait for you. I will do so. Till then, think of the world. Well, Brutus. Thou art noble, yet I see thy honorable metal may be wrought from that it is disposed. Caesar doth bear me hard, but she loves Brutus. If I were Brutus now and he were Cassius, he should not humor me. I will this night in several hands, in at his windows throw as if they came from several citizens, writings all tending to the great opinion that Rome holds of his name, wherein, obscurely, Caesar's ambition shall be glanced at. And after this, 
let Caesar seat her sure, for we will shake her, or worse days endure. A Roman! Ha ha! That's that's my voice! You're hearing it, Cassius! What night is this? Oh, a very pleasing night to honest men. Who ever knew the heavens menace so? Those that have known the earth so full of faults. <laughs> For my part, I have walked about the streets admitting me unto the perilous night, and thus unbraced Casca, as you see, have bared my bosom to the thunderstone. And when the cross blue lightning seemed to open the breast of heaven, I did present myself, even in the aim and very flash of it. Wherefore did you so much tempt the heavens? Is the part of man to fear and tremble when the most mighty gods by tokens Send such dreadful heralds to astonish us. <laughs> oh, you are dull, Casca. And those sparks of life that should be in a Roman, you do want, or else you use not. You look pale and gaze and put on fear and cast yourself in wonder to see the strange impatience of the heavens. You would consider the true cause? Why all these fires? Why all these gliding ghosts? Why birds and beasts from quality and kind? Why old men fool and children calculate? Why all these things change from their ordinance, their natures and preformed faculties to monstrous quality? Why you shall find that heaven hath infused them with these spirits make them instruments of fear and warning unto some monstrous state. Now could I, Casca, name to thee a woman most like this dreadful night, that thunders, lightens, opens graves, and roars as doth the lion in the capital, a woman no mightier than thyself or me in personal action, yet prodigious grown and fearful as these strange eruptions are. Tis Caesar that you mean, is it not, Cassius? Let it be who it is. The Romans now have views and limbs like to their ancestors. But woe the while, our fathers' minds are dead, and we are governed with our mother's spirits. Our yoke and sufferance show us womanish. Indeed. You say the senators tomorrow mean to establish Caesar as a queen. I know where I will wear this weapon then. Cassius, from bondage, will deliver Cassius. <clears throat> oh, therein, ye gods, you make the weak most strong. Therein, ye gods, you tyrants do defeat. Your stony tower and your walls of beaten brass, your airless dungeon, your strong links of iron can be retentive to the strength of spirit. But life, being weary of these worldly bars, never lacks power to dismiss itself. If I know this, though all the world decides, that part of tyranny that I do bear, I can shake off at pleasure. So can I, so every bondman in his own hand bears the power to enter. And why should Caesar be a tyrant then? But O oh, grief, where hast thou led me? I perhaps speak this before a willing bondman. Then I know my answer must be made, that I am armed and dangers are to me indifferent. You speak to Casca! And to such a man who is no fleering telltale, be factious for redress of all these griefs. 
and I will set this foot of mine as far as who goes furthest. There's a bargain made. Take this paper, and look you lay it in the praetor's chair where Brutus may but find it, and throw this in at his window. Set this up with wax upon old Brutus' statue, and all this done, repair to Pompey's porch where you shall find me. I will, High, and so bestow these papers as you bade me. Let us go, for it is after midnight, and ere day, we will awake him and be sure. And for my part, I have no personal cause to spurn at her. But for the general, she would be crowned. How that might change her nature, there's the question. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power. And to speak truth of Caesar, I have not known when her affections swayed more than her reason, but tis a common proof. The lowliness is young ambition's ladder, whereto the climber upward turns her face. But when she once attains the utmost round, she then unto the ladder turns her back, looks in the clouds, spurring, scorning the base degrees by which she did ascend. So Caesar may, unless she may prevent. And since the quarrel will bear no color for the thing she is, fashion it thus, that what she is augmented would run these and these extremities, and therefore think of her as a serpent's egg, which hatched would as her kind grow mischievous and kill her in her shell. Sir, I found a paper thus sealed up, and I am sure it did not lie there when I went to bed. Bring me word. The exultations whizzing in the air give so much light that I may read by them. Brutus, thou sleepst. Awake and see thyself. Shall Rome, etc., speak, strike, redress? Brutus, thou sleepst. Awake. Such instigations have been often dropped where I have took them up. Shall Rome, etc., this I must piece out. Shall Rome stand under one woman's awe? What Rome? My ancestors did from the streets of Rome the Tarkin drive when he was called king. Speak, strike, redress. Am I entreated to speak and strike? Oh, Rome, I make thee promise. If the redress will follow, thou receivest the full petition at the hand of Brutus. Since Cassius first did wet me against Caesar, I have not slept. Between the acting of a dreadful thing and the first motion, all the interim is like a phantasm or a hideous dream. The genius and the mortal instruments are then in council and the state of man like to a little kingdom, suffers then the nature of an insurrection. Sir, it is your brother Cassius at the door, and there are more with him. Let him enter. They are the faction. I think we are too bold upon your rest. 
But Morrow, Brutus, do we trouble you? I have been up this hour, awake all night. Know why these men that come along with you? Yes, every man of them. And no man here but honors you. And every one doth wish you had but that opinion of yourself which every noble Roman bears of you. They are welcome. This casca and this Metellus Simber. Welcome. Let us swear our resolution. Uh, no, not an oath. If not the face of men, the sufferance of our souls, the time's abuse, if these motives be weak, break off the times and every man hence to his idle bed. So let high sighted tyranny rage on till each man drop by lottery. But if these, as I'm sure they do, bear fire enough to kindle cowards and to steal with valor the melting spirits of women, then countrymen, what need we any spur but for our own cause to prick us to redress? What other bond than secret Romans that have spoke the word and will not powder? What other oath than honesty to honesty engaged? And this shall be, or we will fall for it. But do not stain the even virtue of our enterprise, nor the insuppressive metal of our spirits, to think that, or our cause, or our performance, did need an oath. Shall no one else be touched, but only Caesar? Casca, well urged. I think it is not meet Mark Antony, so well beloved of Caesar, should outlive Caesar. We shall find of him a shrewd contriver, and you know, his means, if he improve them, may well stretch so far as to annoy us all. Which, to prevent, let Antony and Caesar fall together. Our, our course will seem too bloody, Caius Cassius. To cut the head off and then hack the limbs, for Antony is but a limb of Caesar. Let us be sacrificers, but not butchers, Caius. We all stand up against the spirit of Caesar, and in the spirit of men, there is no blood. Oh, then that we could come by Caesar's spirit and not dismember Caesar. But alas, Caesar must bleed for it. And gentle friends, Let's kill her boldly, but not wrathfully. Let's carve her a dish fit for the gods, not hew her as a carcass fit for hounds. And let our hearts, as subtle masters do, stir up their servants to an act of rage, and after seem to chide them. This shall make our purpose necessary, but not envious. So appearing to the common eyes, we shall be called perjurers, not murderers. And for Mark Antony, think not of him, for he can do no more than Caesar's arm when Caesar's head is off. Now, yet I fear him, for in the engrafted love he bears to Caesar. Alas, good Cassius, do not think of him. If he loves Caesar, all that he can do is to himself. Take thought and die for Caesar. And that were much he should, for he is given to sport, to wildness, and much company. There is no fear in him. Let him not die, for he will live and laugh at this hereafter. <laughs> but, but it is doubtful yet whether Caesar will come forth today or no. For she is superstitious grown of late, quite from the main opinion she held once of fantasy, of dreams and ceremonies. It may be these apparent prodigies, the unaccustomed terror of this night and the persuasion of her augurers may hold her from the capital today. Never fear that. If she be so resolved, I can oversway her, for I can give her humor the true bent, and I will bring her to the capital. Nay, we will all of us be there to fetch her. By the eighth hour, is that the uttermost? Be that the uttermost, and fail not then. The clock is stricken three. It is time to part. Morning comes upon us. We'll leave you, Brutus. And friends, disperse yourselves, but all remember what you have said. 
and show yourselves true Romans. Verily tis so. And so good morrow to you, everyone. Brutus, my lord. Oh, what mean you? Wherefore rise you now? It is not for your health thus to commit your weak condition to the raw, cold morning. Nor for yours neither. You've ungently, Brutus, stole from my bed. And yesternight, at supper, you suddenly arose and walked about, musing and sighing with your arms across. And when I asked you what the matter was, you stared upon me with ungentle looks. I urged you further, then you scratched your head and too impatiently stamped with your foot. Yet I insisted, yet you answered not. But with an angry wafture of your hand gave sign for me to leave you, so I did. Fearing to strengthen that impatience, which seemed too much enkindled. And withal, hoping it was but an effect of humor, which sometimes hath his hour with every man. It will not let you eat, nor talk, nor sleep. And could it work so much upon your shape as it hath much prevailed on your condition, I should not know you, Brutus. Dear my Lord, make me acquainted with your cause of grief. I am not well in health, and that is all. Brutus is wise, and were he not in health, he would embrace the means to come by it. Why, so I do. Good Portia. Go to bed. Is Brutus sick? And is it physical to walk unbraced and suck up the humors of the dank morning? What, is Brutus sick and will he steal out of his wholesome bed to dare the vile contagion of the night and tempt the roomy and unpurged air to add unto his sickness? No, my Brutus, you have some sick offense within your mind, which by the right and virtue of my place I ought to know of. I charm you by all your vows of love and that great vow which did incorporate and make us one, that you unfold to me, yourself, your half. Why are you heavy and what men tonight have had to resort to you? For here have been some three or four who did hide their faces even from the darkness. Gentle Portia. I should not need if you were gentle Brutus. <sighs> Within the bond of marriage, tell me, Brutus, is it expected I should know no secrets that appertain to you? Am I yourself, but as it were, in sort or limitation to keep with you at meals, comfort your bed, and talk to you sometimes? Dwell I but in the suburbs of your good pleasure? If it be no more, Portia is Brutus's harlot, not his wife. You are my true and honorable wife as dear to me as all the ruddy drops that visit my sad heart. If this were true, then I should know this secret. I grant I am a woman, but with all a woman, Lord Brutus took to wife. I grant I am a woman, but with all a woman well reputed, Cato's daughter. Think you I am no stronger than my sex being so fathered and so husband? Tell me your counsels. Portia, go in a while. My lord, I have made strong proof of my constancy. I will not disclose them. My lord. Leave me with haste. <sighs> Ay me, how weak a thing the heart of a woman is. Oh, Caesar, the heart of Brutus earns to think upon thee. No, 
nor heaven nor earth have been at peace tonight. Thrice hath Calpurnia in her sleep cried out. I dreamt I saw your statue, which like a fountain with a hundred spouts did run pure blood. And many lusty Romans came smiling and did bathe their hands in it. What mean you, Caesar? Think you walk forth? You shall not stir out of your house today. Caesar shall forth. The things that threatened me ne'er looked put on my back. When they shall, shall see the face of Caesar, they are vanished. Caesar, I never stood on ceremonies, yet now they fright me. There's one within, which besides the things that we have seen and heard, recounts most horrid sights seen by the watch. A lioness hath whelped in the streets, and graves have yawned and yielded up their dead. Fierce, fiery warriors fought upon the clouds in ranks and squadrons and right form of war that drizzled blood upon the capital. The noise of battle hurled in the air. Horses did neigh and dying men did groan and ghosts did shriek and squeal about the streets. Oh, Caesar, these things are beyond all use and I do fear them. What can be avoided whose end is purposed by the mighty gods? Yet, Caesar shall go forth, for these predictions are to the world in general as to Caesar. When beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never looked on taste of death but once. Of all the wonders I that I yet have heard, it seems to me most strange that all should fear, seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. Alas, my love, your wisdom is consumed in confidence. Do not go forth today. Call it my fear that keeps you in the house and not your own. We'll send Mark Anthony to the Senate house and he shall say you are not well. Let me, upon my knee, prevail in this. Shall, shall Caesar send a lie? Have I in conquest stretched mine arms so far to be afraid to tell gray beards the truth? Besides, it were a mock act to be rendered for someone to say, break up the Senate till another time when Caesar's wife shall meet with better dreams. If Caesar hide herself, shall they not whisper low Caesar is afraid? Give me my coat. I will go. <sighs> Farewell. Farewell. God knows when we shall meet again. Need a passion. Come not near cast a well metallic simba. There is but one mind in all these men, and it is bent against Caesar. As thou beest not immortal, look about you. Security gives way to conspiracy. The eyes of Macha come! What is now amiss that Caesar and her Senate must redress? Oh, most high, 
most worthy and most puissant Caesar. Metellus Simber throws before thy seat an humble heart. I must prevent thee, Simber. These couchings and these lowly courtesies might fire the blood of ordinary men and turn pre-ordinance and first decree into the law of children. Be not fond to think that Caesar bears such rebel blood that will be thawed from the quali true quality with that which melteth fools. I mean sweet words, low, crooked courtesies, and base spaniel fawning. Thy brother by decree is banished. If thou dost bend and pray and fawn for him, I spurn thee like a cur out of my way. No, Caesar doth not wrong, nor without cause will she be satisfied. Is, is there no voice more worthy than my own to sound more sweetly in great Caesar's ear for the repealing of my banished brother? I kiss thy hand, but not in flattery, Caesar. Desiring thee that Pluvius Simber may have an immediate freedom of repeal. What? Brutus! <clears throat> pardon, Caesar, pardon. As low as to thy foot doth Cassius fall to beg enfranchisement for Publius Simber. I could be well moved if I were as you. If I could pray to move, prayers would move me. But I am constant as the northern star of whose trick too fixed and resting quality there is no fellow in the firmament. The skies are painted with unnumbered sparks. They are all fire and every one doth shine, but there's but one in all doth hold his place. So in the world, it is furnished with, well with men and they are flesh and blood and apprehensive. Yet in the number I do know but one that unassailable holds on her rank, unshaked of motion, and that I am she, let me a little show it even in this, that I was constant, Simber should be banished, and constant do remain to keep him so. Oh, Caesar! Hence! Wilt thou lift up Olympus? Speak hands for me! Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Do Mute. Then fall, Caesar! No! Be not affrighted, fly not, stand stiff. Ambition's debt is paid. There is no harm intended to your person, nor to no Roman else. Where's Antony? Fled to his house amazed. Men, wives, and children stare, cry out, and run as it were duty's day. <laughs> Fates, we will know your pleasures. That we shall die, we know, tis but the time and drawing days out that men stand upon. Why, he that cuts off 20 years of life cuts <laughs> off so many years of fearing death. <laughs> stoop, Romans, stoop, and let us bury the hands in Caesar's blood up to the elbows and besmear our swords and walk we forth even to the marketplace and waving our red weapon for our heads, let us cry peace freedom and liberty. How many ages hence shall this our lofty scene be acted over in <laughs> states unborn and accents yet unknown? <laughs> How many times shall Caesar bleed and sport that is now on Pompey's basis lies along no worthier than the dust? 
Though oft as that shall be, so often shall the not of us be called the men that gave their country liberty. But shall we forth? Aye, every man away. Brutus shall lead, and we will grace his heels with the most oldest and best hearts of Rome. Soft. But here comes Antony. Welcome, Mark Antony. Oh, mighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glories, triumphs, spoils shrunk to this little measure? Fare thee well. I know not, gentlemen, what you intend. Who else must be let blood? Who else is rank? If I myself, there is no hour so fit as Caesar's death hour, nor no instrument of half that worth as those your swords made rich with the most noble blood of all this world. I do beseech ye, if you bear me hard now, whilst your purpled hands do reek and smoke fulfill your pleasure. Live a thousand years, I shall not find myself so apt to die. No place will please me, so no mean of death, as here by Caesar and by you cut off. The choice and master spirits of this age. Oh, Antony, beg not your death of us. So now we must appear bloody and cruel, as by our hands and on this present act. You see, we do, yet see you but our hands. And this the bleeding business they have done. Our hearts you see not. They are pitiful, and pity to the general wrongs of Rome. As fire drives out fire, so pity, pity hath done this deed on Caesar. For your part, to you our swords have led in points, Mark Antony, our arms in strength of malice, and our hearts of brother's temper do receive you, do receive you in with all kind of love, good thoughts, and reverence. Your voice shall be as strong as any man's in the disposing of new dignities. <sighs> Only be patient till we have appeased the multitude beside themselves with fear. And then we will deliver with you the cause why I that did love Caesar when I struck her have thus proceeded. I doubt not of your wisdom. Let, let each man render me his bloody hand first. Marcus Brutus, will I shake with you? Next, Caius Cassius, do I take your hand? Now yours, Metellus. And my valiant Casca, yours. Gentlemen, all. Alas, what shall I say? My credit now stands on such slippery ground that one of two bad ways you must conceit me, either a coward or a flatterer. Oh, that I did love thee, Caesar. Oh, it is true. If then thy spirit look now upon us, shall it not grieve thee dearer than thy death to see thy Anthony making his peace? Shaking the bloody fingers of thy foes, most noble in the presence of thy course. Had I as many eyes as thou hast wounds, weeping as fast as they stream forth thy blood, it would become me better than to close in terms of friendships with thy enemies. Pardon me, Julius. 
Mark Antony. <laughs> yeah. Pardon me, Caius Cassius. If the enemies of Caesar shall say this, then in a friend it is cold modesty. I blame you not for praising Caesar so, but what compact mean you to have with us? Will you be pricked in number of our friends or shall we on and not depend on you? Therefore I took your hands, but was indeed swayed from the point by looking down on Caesar. Friends, am I with you all and love you all upon this hope that you may give me reasons why and wherein Caesar was dangerous. Or else were this a savage spectacle. Our reasons are so full of good regard that were you, Antony, the son of Caesar, you should be satisfied. That's all I seek. And am moreover suitor that I may produce her body to the marketplace and in the pulpit as becomes a friend, speak in the order of her funeral. You shall not in your funeral speech blame us, but speak all good you can devise of Caesar and say you do it by our permission, else shall you not have any hand at all about her funeral. I do desire no more. Prepare the body then and follow us. Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth, that I am meek and gentle with these butchers. Thou art the ruins of the noblest woman that ever lived in the tide of times. Woe to the hand that spilled this costly blood over thy wounds now. Do I prophesy, which like dumb mouths do ope their ruby lips to beg the voice and utterance of my tongue. A curse shall light upon the limbs of men. Domestic fury and fierce civil strife shall cumber all the parts of Italy. Blood and destruction shall be so in use and dreadful objects so familiar that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered with the hands of war. All pity choked with the custom of fell deeds. And Caesar's spirit, ranging for revenge, with Ate by her side come hot from hell shall in these confines with a monarch's voice cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war that this foul deed shall smell above the earth with carrion men groaning for burial oh caesar Countrymen and lovers, hear me for my cause and be silent that you may hear. Believe me for mine honor and have respect to mine honor that you may believe. Censure me in your wisdom and awake your senses that you may the better judge. If there be any in this assembly, if there be any in this assembly, any dear friend of Caesar, to them I say, Brutus' love for Caesar was no less than theirs. If then that friend demand why Brutus rose against Caesar, this is my answer. Not that I loved Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more. 
Had you rather Caesar were living and die all slaves than that Caesar were dead to live all free men? As Caesar loved me, I weep for her. As she was fortunate, I rejoice at it. As she was valiant, I honor her. But as she was ambitious, I slew her. There are tears for her love, joy for her fortune, honor for her valor, and death for her ambition. I have done no more to Caesar than you shall do to Brutus. The question of her death is enrolled in the capital. Her glory not extenuated wherein she was worthy, nor her offenses enforced for she for which she suffered death. Here comes her body, mourned by Mark Antony, who though he had no hand in her death, shall receive the benefit of her dying, a place in the commonwealth, as which of you shall not. With this, I depart. And as I slew my best lover for the good of Rome, I have the same dagger for myself, when it shall please my country to need my death. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise her. The evil men do lives after them. The good is often turred with their bones, so let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it were a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, by leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. She was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says she was ambitious and Brutus is an honorable man. She hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. <laughs> did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says she was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal, I thrice presented her a queenly crown, which she did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? But Brutus says she was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love her once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for her? Oh, judgment! Thou art fled to brutish beasts and men have lost their reason. <laughs> Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. You all do know this mantle. Look, in this place ran Cassius' dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this, the well-beloved Brutus stabbed. Yes. This was the most unkindest cut of all. For when noble Caesar saw him stab, ingratitude, more strong than traitor's arms, quite vanquished her than 
burst her mighty heart. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen. Then I and you and all of us fell down whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Friends, weak friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. But here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in her closet, tis her will. To every Roman citizen she gives, to every several man, 75 drachmas. Moreover, she hath left you all her walks, her private arbors, and new planted orchards. Here was a Caesar! When comes such another? Uh, now, let it work. Mischief, thou art afoot. Take what course thou wilt. I miss not prophecy, but let time's news be known. When it is brought forth. How pretty a week for Caesar's death. Mark Anthony was straight to visit us. Brutus and Cassius ride like madmen through the gates of Rome. Be like, like they had some notice of the people. How Anthony had moved them. <laughs> Most noble brother, you have done me wrong. Judge me, you gods, wrong I mine enemies? And if not so, how should I wrong a brother? Brutus, this sober form of yours hides wrongs, and when you do them... Cassius, be content. Speak your griefs softly. That you have wronged me doth appear in this. You have condemned and noted Lucius Pella for taking bribes here of the Sardians, wherein my letters, praying on his side because I knew the man, were slighted off. You wronged yourself to write in such a case. In such a time as this, it is not meet that every nice offense should bear his comment. Let me tell you, Cassius, you yourself are much condemned to have an itching palm, to sell in marchers offices for gold to underservers. I an itching palm. You know that you are Brutus that speak this, or by the gods, this speech were else your last. <laughs> the name of Cassius honors this corruption, and chastisement doth therefore hide his head. Chastisement. Remember, March, the Ides of March, remember? Did not great Julius bleed for justice sake? What villain touched her body that did stab and not for justice? What? Shall one of us that struck the foremost woman of all this world, but for supporting robbers, shall we now contaminate our fingers with base bribes and sell the mighty space of our large honors for so much trash as may be grasped thus? I had rather be a dog and bay the moon than such a Roman. Brutus, bay not me. I'll not endure it. You forget yourself to hedge me in. I am a soldier. I, older in practice, abler than yourself. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh do. You are not Scatches. I am. Oh, I say you are not. Urge me no more. I shall forget myself. Have mind oh. upon your health. Tempt me no further. Oh, away, slight man. It's possible. Oh, hear me. But I will speak. Must I give way and room 
to your rash collar? Shall I be frighted when a madman scares? Oh, ye gods, ye gods, must I endure all this? All this? I more. Fret till your proud heart break. Go show your slaves how choleric you are and make your bondmen tremble. Must I budge? Must I observe you? Must I stand and crouch under your testy humor? By the gods! You shall digest the venom of your spleen, though it do split you. For from this day forth, I'll use you for my mirth. And for my laughter when you are waspish. Does it come to this? You say you are a better soldier? Let it appear so. Make your vaunting true, and it shall please me well. For mine own part, I shall be glad to learn of noble men. You wrong me every way. You wrong me, Brutus. I said an elder soldier, not a better. Did I say better? If you did, I cannot. When Caesar lived, she durst not thus have moved me. Peace. Peace. You durst not so have tempted her. I durst not? No. What, durst not tempt her? For your life you durst not. Do not presume too much upon my love. I may do that I shall be sorry for. You have done that which you should be sorry for. There is no terror, Cassius, in your threats. For I am armed so strong in honesty that they pass by me as the idle wind, which I respect not. I did send to you for certain sums of gold which you denied me. For I can raise no money by vile means. By heaven, I had rather coin my heart and drop my blood for drachmas than to wring from the hard hands of peasants their vile trash by any indirection. I did send to you for gold to pay my legions, which you denied me. Was that done like Cassius? Should I have answered Caius Cassius so when Marcus Brutus grows so covetous? to lock such rascal counters from his friends. Be ready, gods, with your thunderbolts. Dash him to pieces. I denied you not. You did. I did not. He was but a fool that brought my answer back. A friend should bear his friend's infirmities, but Brutus makes mine greater than they are. I do not, till you practice them on me. You love me not. I do not like your faults. A friendly eye could never see such faults. A flatterer would not, though they do appear as high as huge as high Olympus. Oh, come, Antony and young Calpurnia, come. Revenge yourselves alone on Cassius, for Cassius is a weary of the world. Hated by one he loves, braved by his brother, checked like a bondman, all his faults observed, set in a notebook, learned and conned by rote to cast into my teeth. Oh, I could weep my spirit from mine eyes. There's my weapon, and here my naked breast. Within, a heart dearer than Plutus's mine, richer than gold. If that thou beest a Roman, take it forth. I that denied thee gold will give my heart. Strike, as thou didst at Caesar, for I know when thou didst hate her worst, thou lovedst her better than ever thou lovest Cassius. Leave your weapon. Be angry when you will. It shall have scope. Do what you will. This honor shall be humor. Cassius, you are yoked with a lamb that carries anger as the flint bears fire who much enforced, shows a hasty spark and straight is cold again. Had Cassius lived to be but mirth and laughter to his Brutus when grief and blood ill-tempered vexeth him? When I spoke that, I was ill-tempered too. You confess so much. Give me your hand. And my heart too. I did not think you could have been so angry. Cassius, I'm sick of many griefs. 
you know, of your philosophy, you make no use if you give place to accidental evils. No man bears sorrow better. Portia is dead. Portia. She is dead. How escaped I killing when I crossed you so? Oh, insupportable and touching loss. Upon what sickness? Impatient of my absence and the grief that young Calpurnia with Mark Antony had made themselves so strong. And with her death, the tidings came. With this, she fell distract and her attendants absent. Swallowed fire. And died so. Even so. Speak no more of her. In this I will bury all unkindness, Cassius. My heart is thirsty for that noble pledge. That till the spirit or swell the cup. I cannot drink too much of Brutus love. <laughs> Welcome, good Metellus. Now sit we close and call in question our necessities. Metellus, I have here received letters that young Calpurnia and Mark Antony come down upon us with a mighty power, bending their expedition toward Philippi. I still have letters of the selfsame tenor. With what addition? That by prescription and bill of outlawry, young Calpurnia and Antony have put to death an hundred senators. Therein our letters do not well agree. Mine spoke of 70 senators that died by their prescriptions. Had you your letters from your wife, my lord? No, Metellus. Nor nothing in your letters writ of her? Nothing, Metellus. That, methinks, is strange. Why well, ask you? Hear you aught of her in yours? Uh, no, my lord. Now, as you are a Roman, tell me true. Then, like a Roman, bear the truth I tell. For certain, she is dead, and by strange manner. My farewell, Portia. We must die, Metellus meditating that she must die once. I have the patience to endure it now. Even so, great men, great losses should endure. To our work alive. What do you think of marching to Philippi presently? I do not think it good. Your reason? Yes, it is. Tis better that the enemy seek us. So shall he waste his means, weary his soldiers, doing himself offense, whilst we, lying still, are full of rest, defense, and nimbleness. Good reasons must, of force, give place to better. The people twixt Philippi and this ground do stand but a forced affection, for they have grudged us contribution. The enemy, marching along by them, shall make a fuller number up, come on refreshed, new added, and encouraged. From which advantage shall we cut him off? If at Philippi we do face him there, these people are back. Then with your will go on. We'll along ourselves and meet them at Philippi. There's no more to say. No more. Good night. Good night. Early tomorrow will we rise and hence. Everything is well. Good night, my lord. Good night. With wasteful wash of statues overturned.
and broils root out the work of masonry. The Mars his sword, no war's quick fire shall burn. The living record of your memory. Who comes here? I think it is the weakness of mine eyes that shapes this monstrous apparition. It, it comes upon me. Art thou anything? Art thou some god, some angel, or some devil that makes my blood cold and my hair to stare? Speak to me what thou art. Thy evil spirit, Rutus. Comes thou. To tell thee, thou shalt see me at Philippi. When shall I see thee again? I, at Philippi. I, I will see thee at Philippi then. <laughs> Now I have taken heart, thou vanished ill spirit. I would hold more talk with thee. Didst thou dream, Brutus? Didst thou see anything? Soldier, go and commend me to my brother Cassius. Bid him set on his powers but time before, and we will follow. It shall be done, my lord. Now, Antony, our hopes are answered. You said the enemy would not come down, but keep the hills and upper regions. It proves not so. Their battles are at hand. They mean to warn us at Philippi here, answering before we do demand of them. But I'm in their bosoms and I know wherefore they do it. They could be content to visit other places and come down with fearful bravery, thinking by this face to facet in our thoughts that they have courage, but tis not so. Prepare you, generals. The enemy comes on in galleon show. Their bloody sign of battle is hung out, and something to be done immediately. Calpurnia, lead your battle softly on, upon the left hand of the even field. Upon the right hand I, keep thou the left. Why do you cross me in this exigent? I do not cross you, but I will do so. Mark Anthony. Shall we give sign of battle? No, says Aris. We will wait on their charge. Make forth. The generals would have some words. Words before blows. Is it so, countrymen? Not that we love words better, as you do. <laughs> good words are better than bad strokes, Galpurnia. In your bad strokes, Brutus, you give good words. Witness the hole you made in Caesar's heart, crying, long live, hail Caesar. Antony, the posture of your blows are yet unknown, but for your words, they rob the hybla bees and leave them honeyless. Not stingless too. Oh yes, and soundless too, for you have stolen their buzzing, Antony, and very wisely threat before you sting. Villains, you didst not when your vile Daggers, when your vile daggers in the sides of Caesar, you showed your teeth like apes, and fawned like hounds, and bowed like bondmen kissing Caesar's feet, while damned Casca, like a cur behind, struck Caesar on the neck. Oh, you flatterers! Flatterers! Now, Brutus, thank yourself. This tongue had not offended so today if Cassius might have ruled. Come, come! The cause, if arguing make us sweat, the proof of it shall turn to redder drops. Look, I draw my weapon against conspirators. When think you this weapon goes up again? Never, 
till Caesar's three and thirty wounds be well avenged, or till another Caesar have added slaughter to the sword of traitors. Caesarus, thou canst not die by traitors' hands unless thou bringst them with thee. So I hope. I was not born to die on Brutus' sword. Or if thou wert the noblest of thy name, young woman, thou couldst not die more honorable. Ah, a peevish schoolgirl, worthless of such honor, joined with a masker and a reveler. Old Cassius still. Defiance, traitors, hurl we in your teeth. If you dare fight today, come to the field. If not, when you have the stomachs. Most noble Brutus, the gods today stand friendly that we may, lovers in peace, lead on our days to age. But since the affairs of men rest still uncertain, let's reason with the worst that may befall. If we do lose this battle, then is this the very last time we shall speak together? What are you then determined to do? I do find it cowardly and vile for fear of what might fall. So to prevent the time of life, arming myself with patience to stay the providence of some high powers that govern us below. Then if we lose this battle, you are contented to be led in triumph through the streets of Rome? No, Cassius, no. Think not, thou noble Roman, that ever Brutus will go bound to Rome. It bears too great a mind. This same day must end the work the Ides of March began. And whether we shall meet again, I know not. Therefore, our everlasting farewell take. Forever and forever, farewell, Cassius. If we do meet again, why, we shall smile. If not, why then, this parting was well made. Forever and forever, farewell, Brutus. If we do meet again, we'll smile indeed. If not, tis true, this parting was well made. Why then lead on, away! Brutus gave the word too early. His soldiers fell to spoil, while Reese by Antony are all enclosed. Are those my tents where I perceive the fire? This day I breathed first. <gasps> Time has come around, and where I did begin, there shall I end. My life is run his compass. Caesar, thou art revenged. He is slain. O oh, Caesar, thou art mighty yet! Thy spirit walks abroad and turns our swords in our own proper entrails. I know my hour is come. Our enemies have beat us to the pit. It is more worthy to leap in ourselves than tarry till they push us. Farewell to you, and you, and you. Caesar, now be still. I killed thee not with half so good a will.
He is dead. This was the noblest Roman of them all. All the conspirators, save only he, did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He only, in a general honest thought, and common good to all made one of them. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. According to his virtue, let us use him with all respect and rites of burial. Within my tent, his bones shall lie tonight, most like a soldier, ordered honorably. So call the field to rest and let's away to part the glories of this happy day. <laughs> 